Michael Newton, and she has a book on the Tower of Babel, The Tower of Babel, which is a great book. And she also has a family life story book, and I would like to welcome everyone to the Reynolds Park City Council Planning Commission. At this time, we'll have the invitation to plan or practice. Dr. Paula Martin, following the invitation, please remove the banner for the Pledge of Allegiance. We will continue to walk through the debate and prayer in the uniform. We thank you, God, for those that have set out over us and have harmed the earth, produced all the things that the earth has taken care of us, the fire, the fire. But God, let the people of God just be done peacefully in our city. Have your way in touch their minds, touch their hearts, and their spirits, that they may also be firm in you. We thank you, God, for the opportunity to sow it, to help those who are suffering. I pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance. Please be seated. Please be seated. Will the clerk please call the roll? Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Baker. Council Member Baker. Council Member Brian. Council Member Council Member Strickland. Council Member Savati. Council Member Pecoraw. Council Member Lawsonero. Council Member Hartnett. And President Goodwin. President Goodwin. Next we have the approval of the agenda. We are adding two motions to tonight's agenda. That will be items nine C and D. Next we have the approval of minutes. Approval of City Council regular meeting minutes of July 11, 2022. Are there any additions, there deletions, any additions or, corrections or corrections to those minutes? To those minutes. Seeing none, the Seeing minutes stand none, approved as submitted. Next, approved as submitted. Next we have community Next comments. Have the community comments, comments portion, portion of the meeting is an opportunity of the meeting is an for citizens to address citizens council. To address council. Citizens, may wish to bring citizens may wish to the attention of city council and discuss and items and on the agenda. Before addressing city council, Before members of the public are asked to continue their speaking time and give us cue for church. The council president will invite council speakers to step to the microphone with their name and address. All remarks will be addressed to council as a whole and not exceed three minutes. Council may not respond to specific comments or questions from the public. Do we have any questions or comments from the public on this? Thank you. Did the clerk receive any email from the community? Thank you. Are there any comments from council? Do we have any comments Do from Mayor Begley? Yes, yes, Madam President, yes, uh, members, members of council, council, a number of council, items for council to see you for this evening. Uh, first of all, uh, because uh, council will hopefully be hearing audio discussed during the month of August, I wanted to remind all of you that the Kenota Festival is August 4th, 5th, and 6th, and we're looking forward to seeing all of you out there. Uh, there's still plenty of opportunities to join in on the spaghetti eating contest or perhaps the dunk tank. There's a lot of options there for all of you. Uh, I've also put out uh, the Kenota Festival signs behind some of you that I've not been able to reach over the last couple of days, so I would just not put that sign in already, so those are there for you. Uh, I want to give you kind of an update on a couple of things. Uh, first off, the theme of grant status. Um, Auditor Sisak and I and uh, Curtis Director Gorman uh, met with uh, the FEMA regulator for the grant process for the floodway work. Uh, we are going to be bidding that work out. It's a very comprehensive plan uh, that will go out there, and again, this is going to be covered by, you know, 300,000 of it will be covered by uh, the federal government, and the remainder of the council will be approved for us. It's going to be about an 18 to 24-month process, probably a little closer to 18 months if we just want to give them fresh some room. Uh, there will be a number of public meetings scheduled. Most likely there will be five. Uh, some meetings will be for the overall project, kind of like to open the discussion, and then another one to close things. Uh, with the results of what the work uh, entails, and then other ones may be more specific to areas in Reynolds where bid have expanded the most, uh, typically anywhere along the Delta Creek area, things like that. 
Um, all those uh, public meetings will be open and live streamed, assuming everything goes as not working at that point in time, uh, and all of that. And again, you don't, if you're, if it's specifically about the state of Briarcliff area, that doesn't mean that other people cannot join. It just means this topic will be something that's not actually specific to this. Uh, we also have some news on the Main Street program. Again, progress is continuing to move forward. Northbound Jackson to eastbound Wagner is almost complete. Uh, the lanes should be switching soon, uh, so they're, they're working on, I guess you could say, the east lane. Now they're going to work on the other side. Uh, it's still be able to travel northbound on that. Um, AEP will be removing the power line soon, uh, sometime probably within the next couple of weeks, whoever gets funding. Uh, this will also follow uh, removal of some of the poles that are in there right now, and then concrete will go over it and kind of finish that area off. Uh, work should move uh, to the north side of Main Street by Street probably the end of August, the again, weather permitting, and then they'll work their way back basically from Jackson all the way to uh, Mandela Plaza in that area where the former Hunter's Lodge is at. Uh, we're working with uh, the engineers and also uh, the business owners on that effort to just make sure that we maintain everything as open as possible and so we know what plumbing we're getting. Phase two will be starting out in the not too distant future. Uh, Columbia Gas will be out in the coming days. Uh, the survey group was out there last week and they were out there last week. Uh, they're actually working as well. Uh, this will not be near as complex uh, as what you know phase one is. There's no major intersections and a lot of the connectors are actually not on Main Street right now. Some other construction news. Some other construction news. Uh, with the American Recovery Act, we started working down at Grand Road Path. Association of Franklin County Engineers Office uh, for access to the back of that bridge and that port. Uh, once that bridge is completed, we'll be having access to that bridge and that port for the rest of the time. So we'll be able to get uh, off all the way to the back of the bridge. And I think that's all I have for you guys as far as the update on the uh, is. Uh, we do have some things to clean up. When we return in September, uh, we will be appointing a new management advisor for the Main Street Area Planning Commission. We'll talk to him about the power line issues and how that will affect the Main Street Area Planning Commission. Uh, he'll also be submitting a new version of the Planning Commission report as well. So we'll have some auditors and audits and things like that. There's a pillar of Army work and all sorts of things that we're planning and that will be coming up in September. So we'll have some new management people uh, to take over that work. So we'll see how that goes. At this time, we will have a presentation by the Tobacco Control Initiative. And I can introduce the program at this time.
concerned about the number of retailers that we have in the city of Reynoldsburg and um, how can we, you know, make sure that it doesn't get oversaturated um, with retailers? And you can add um, different components of the law if you choose to do so as a community, right? It's very powerful as a community to then be able to control the tobacco retail environment um, and protect the lives of the constituents with li which live um, in your community. And then it also allows um, municipalities, again, to uh, look at point of sale um, and other areas of regulation. So it also provides a comprehensive list. So this is really important. So currently, under Ohio law, there is no way to be able to have a comprehensive list of all the retailers. So not just retailers that sell combustible products. Right now, um, retailers will say, hey, we already pay a fee. Yeah, you pay a fee to the state auditors. It's a tax. It's not a license. Um, and so that's a, a separate thing. Uh, when it comes to um, shops that only sell vapor products or don't sell combustible products, there is no mechanism at this point in time to even know where they're selling, who they're selling to. Um, there's no comprehensive list. In fact, when I go to pull the retailers in the city of Reynoldsburg, what I found is that through a Google search, I pulled up 16 different, um, in, by the zip code, pulled up 16 different uh, retailers that are tobacco shops or vapor shops, right? Um, if I put that against the list of those who were inspected by the FDA, those shops don't even make the FDA inspection list because they're not licensed or there's no way to even put them on um, a, a way of, of finding out where they are. Okay, so um, it's certainly an important way. Um, going a little bit crazy on my thing here. <laughs> so um, it also authorizes the health department. So the way this uh, program works to a model policy, it gives the authority to the health department, just as they license food uh, within uh, a community, it gives them the ability to uh, put this retail license in place for tobacco uh, retail sales as well. And it gives the health department the ability to revoke or suspend that license if um, violators continue to sell um, when they're not supposed to. So the way the penalty structure works is um, ideally, and this is just an example of one, um, there's a fine that's given um, on the first violation and then perhaps by the fourth violation, depending on how the health department and the city decides to do it, um, you can revoke or suspend the retailer's license to sell, um, just as we have with alcohol and other um, licensing um, schemes. Also, um, a license fee allows for this to be a fully sustainable uh, program, right? This license fee then provides um, the oversight with um, two compliance checks, with um, the ability for the health department to, to oversee, and the city, again, to control the retail environment um, at no cost to um, the members of that community. And then a tobacco retail license also uh, protects the most valuable and vulnerable members of our, of our communities. When um, looking at research localities with strong retailer licensing laws, has a de 33, just snooze on its own, 33 decrease, um, percent decrease in youth initiation and 26 less likely to initiate e-cigarette use over the course of 1.5 years. And um, this actually increases. This was actually, uh, the study was done after a year and a half. Um, what we're seeing is that even um, as the TRLs are implemented, the longer those TRLs are implemented, the um, greater the decrease in youth initiation um, of these products. So um, thus far in Ohio, there are um, 15 different locations that ha have passed a tobacco retail license. In fact, the city of Kent just passed a tobacco retail license um, last week. And it would be great to have Reynoldsburg um, added to our list as number 16 um, as well. And these um, retail licenses are all over with oversight from the city or county health department, um, just as we would ideally like to do for the city of Reynoldsburg with Franklin County Public Health as being um, that health department. So um, hopefully, if you have any questions, we'd love to um, you know, help you resolve any of those issues. I also put um, information, there's a packet of information that was shared. You can reach us if you um, 
do the QR code um, that's also on the little pack of mints that we gave you. It takes us right to, right to our website um, and a video that further explains what a tobacco retail license is in a community. Um, and I just want to leave you with, with, with this thought. Um, if you, you know, if it's the cost of doing business in a community and um, for a retail license. If you sell food in a community, right, we wouldn't want to go to get food at a place that we didn't know had good oversight. Um, and this is what this does. It allows for oversight of um, products and sales of products um, to protect the community in which you all serve. So. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Councilwoman Strickland. So thank you for the presentation. A lot of information um, that was there, and thank you for that. So I do have a few questions for you. Um, you provided the failure rate for Reynoldsburg, but what is the failure rate for Ohio itself? Um, shoot, I did have that um, with me. I think the overall failure rate for Ohio is 19%. Um, it's difficult to um, look at the failure rate um, for state as well as localities. Um, and the reason that is is because the way the inspections are done under FDA inspections are a little bit different than the way they ideally should be done. Um, they use oftentimes their decoys are um, look like they're younger. Um, and also, they're looking for civ uh, criminal penalties. We are, this is civil penalties on the retailer themselves, <coughs> nothing on, on the underage youth. Um, so it's either way, the city of Reynoldsburg has a high um, um, failure rate to selling to underage youth. Okay, thank you. Um, also, you, all, uh, you provided the uh, a percentage of repeat failure um, offenders, I'm going to say, here in Reynoldsburg. Um, do we know who those offenders are? Is that cast somewhere? Okay. Yep. okay. Yes, I can provide that information. Um, I pulled it from the FDA Compliance Inspection website. Um, so, yes, you can see which retailers, and I'd be happy to send an email out to council to be able to see which retailers have failed. Um, again, reminding. Um, council that this only includes those who have um, a combustible sales um, tax, not necessarily those who sell only vapor product um, e-cigarettes um, under current Ohio under current Ohio law. Okay, thank you. And then one more question, then I'll be done. I promise. Um, what is the um, percent of retails actually in Reynoldsburg? I know you said sixteen. But just keep in mind that Reynoldsburg, the 43068, has also included Columbus. Yes. So go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No. Good question. And it does get a little bit tricky um, because to tweeze out, um, and I literally went on a map today and was kind of trying to tweeze it out. Now, the 16 are only vape and tobacco shops. That does not include your gas stations, your convenience stores. If you, and I, I did draw those in as well today. Um, and it looks like it's close to 40 um, tobacco retail stores or places that um, you can buy a tobacco product in the city of Reynoldsburg. Um, I did not include in my search pharmacies. So we do know that some pharmacies, aside from CVS, um, also sell um, tobacco products. So 40 is an estimate. Um, it could be closer to 50 if um, it's done more intently. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Councilwoman Lawson Rowe. Thank you, Madam President. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, two questions that I think I know the answer to, but I'd like for you to share, to expound further. Um, Last council meeting, we had a, a neighbor who actually offered that she owns a couple of gas stations. Well, she owns two businesses, let me just say that. Um, I, I'm not sure what her businesses actually offer, but um, if I'm not sure if her businesses only offer combustible 
products or if it's both combustible and the other. So uh, she shared that she's already paying a fee and that her business is already listed. Can you help us unpack and decipher that? Sure. So what she's referring to is, again, the state auditor's tax. Um, so she does pay, I think it's a $125 fee um, annually for that. That um, is a tax. It's not a license. It doesn't give um, full authority to be able to, I mean, they do inspections. The inspections are not frequent enough. They're not on an annual basis. Um, and so this additional license fee would be um, then give the health department the authority to, or the financial ability to be able to be more comprehensive in how they're executing um, the, to making sure that they're not being sold to underage um, individuals or um, as well. So it's an additional fee, um, yes, um, but that additional fee is pretty minimal if you're thinking about it from the risk factor of selling um, to underage individuals. Thank that you. Answer your, that Thank answer you. Question? And then you shared a little bit about the benefits of the program. I'd like to understand um, for you to share more benefits of this program and the benefit of having the license, the licenses versus just the fees that are being paid in taxes. Sure. So um, the license, a comprehensive license, would give, first of all, Reynoldsburg a complete list of all those retailers um, and allow then uh, every retailer that sold any type of nicotine or tobacco product within the city of Reynoldsburg would have to get that license. It would then allow you um, to have a better pulse on um, the retail environment in the city of Reynoldsburg. It would also then allow, um, perhaps council wants to put more um, other kind of add-ons to be able, again, to further um, look at, well, maybe we don't want so many retailers um, near a school or near a park. Or perhaps we're like, hey, we already have 50 retailers in, a, in the city of Reynoldsburg. Perhaps you know we want to look at increasing other healthy, healthier um, businesses as opposed to businesses that continue to um, become dependent or dependent upon addiction um, and um, you know poor health of the constituents that live here. So those are a couple um, of the the big factors that allow you to have when you have a TRL that allows that community to to have that oversight and that additional um, piece of leverage. And we've seen, because we work on this across the country, when retailers are, are at risk of losing their ability to sell tobacco products, behavior changes. A um, gas station that sells tobacco products probably makes around half a million dollars in tobacco sales alone. So another $300 fee for them to make sure they're complying with the law is really the cost of doing business. But that is where we see the behavior changing. This is in lieu of penalizing kids. It's putting the onus on the retailer to comply with the law. And again, as Wendy said, it gives you this platform to do more. So if you decide down the road, you want to do something around flavored tobacco products, you now have this platform to regulate it and make sure that it's done appropriately. Because again, this is a health issue. It's not a, it's not a criminal safety issue, it's a health issue. And it gives the um, ability for the health department to really make sure they're complying with the law and keeping kids safe and healthy. Council Member Packerell. Thank you. I have, a two, I have two questions for you. So in your presentation, I saw that Ohio has a grade F. Um, and that I assume that's a failure grade. What are the parameters that you uh, decide to make it? Is it the age limit? So um, actually, we, we have the age limit. <laughs> um, it received an F from a grading standpoint because it doesn't have a comprehensive um, uh, retail license for all retailers at the state level. Um, it also received um, an F because of, that's the biggest reason. <laughs> the penalty, um, yeah. yeah, the penalty structure um, is poor from an enforcement standpoint. Once you, when you cannot revoke those license, um, that makes it, it's a poor, poor um, license. 
Um, so those were the two, that's the biggest thing, is that there was no tobacco retail license um, associated with um, 21, right? You raised the age, and that's good, um, because that's helpful. Um, but it also, lastly, I forgot this, um, we still have penalties on the clerks um, in Ohio. So in other words, if I own a, a shop, right, a, any type of shop, um, and I'm, or I'm a clerk, and I work making, you know, $9 an hour, um, and I sell um, to an underaged um, individual, I'm the one that faces that misdemeanor penalty, penalty on my record. I'll probably lose my job. Um, and, right, I have a record now because I sold to an underage. So that penalty under current Ohio law rests on the clerk. The retailer, meanwhile, who owns the shop, who may not have done a good job at educating the clerk about how to check IDs properly or, or anything, um, they go off scot-free. Um, so a retail license locally can change that, right? It can put all of that onus, all of that responsibility should be on the retailer themselves, um, not on that maybe 18-year-old kid who's, you know, making a, trying to work um, or what have you, um, and then they get settled with that penalty. So those are the biggest um, faults under current Ohio law um, that we really, a TRL at the local level can reimagine for a community. Thank you. One more. So I know that Columbus, they enforce that this with the Columbus Public Health enforces this law, but Reynoldsburg, we don't have health department. So how, how can we enforce that yeah. if so, we were to adopt that? Yeah, so what you do is you, auth you give the authority to local, which here it's Franklin County, as your local health department um, to be able to do that oversight. Uh, we have the same structure in Cuyahoga County right now. Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga County Public Health um, has 48 different communities that they have oversight over. Um, from a TRL perspective, um, each community has to pass a TRL and then give that authority. So Cuyahoga County, for instance, has nine communities um, right now that have passed a TRL that they provide oversight for. So the Franklin County um, Public Health would do so. We've had conversations with um, the health commissioner, and um, they are, you know, there is that potential for them to provide that oversight. Thank you. Council Member Savati. Councilman Packer, I'll take my question, so no questions. Do we have any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have a presentation by OHM regarding Civic Park. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ashley Efall with OHM. Um, Mark Bachrath, OHM. Um, I'm, I'm the director of planning and urban design here. Ashley and I, we both work at our Columbus office. Correct. And I am the project manager on Civic Park, which I'll be giving you an update about today. Uh, also want to mention that we do have a sub-consultant, uh, EMHMT, on this project. Not with us today, but they have been focused more on the utility planning and some of the survey work that's gone on on site. Uh, let me grab my pointer here. Okay, so tonight we're going to be talking about uh, the master plan updates, uh, what we've done to date over the last six months of this project, uh, which includes in community engagement, which led to some of our master plan revisions. Um, which then led directly into our design development draft. It's about a 30% design document, um, which we'll touch on a few things from tonight. Uh, and then we are going to focus more so on the phase one of the project, uh, more so than the rest of the park and the design and the cost estimate for that. And then also the next steps as a part of our, our contract for this, this project. So in February, March of this year, we met with a few different community groups um, along with um, the city, some team members from the city. So the Everest Cricket Club provided some great insight on the cricket field and some of that, uh, the pitch information and that those specs which uh, helped influence our design in the master plan. Uh, the Columbus Flyers Club and some other 
uh, uh, disc golf stakeholders. We actually met with virtually and out on site and went through and actually staked some of the locations for uh, the tee, tee pads for disc golf and also the basket locations. And we were able to keep a lot of the, those locations that we staked on site. And then finally, we also met with city staff and the director of the Special Olympics for Franklin County to talk through some of the different field designs uh, and the general design for the overall park. So, and hopefully it's showing up a little better on your screens than up there. Uh, it looks a little pixelated here. But, um, so those, the feedback from those groups led directly into some of the master plan updates that we have since we talked to you guys. I think Aaron from our office talked to you last fall. So the cricket field location has shifted. Uh, we didn't have enough uh, room in the old location, so that has shifted south. Uh, it's been enlarged and uh, detailed out so it's a little closer to a traditional cricket field um, that you typically see. Then we also have enlarged the turf adaptive sports field in the lower right corner so that can actually um, accommodate an 11 v 11 uh, soccer game. Uh, along with some double striping for lacrosse. From what we understand, it's becoming a lot more popular in Reynoldsburg uh, with some fencing and some field lighting, fight, field lighting along with that. Um, and then the dog park has actually, on the south side to the far left in the graphic, has been enlarged from a one-acre dog park in the previous graphic um, last year to about a 4.5-acre dog park. So a lot larger, um, it can uh, accommodate a lot more people, a lot more dogs, and it has a lot more elements to it, which we'll kind of get into a little further on in the presentation. So the disc golf course layout has also changed. It was previously kind of concentrated in the lower left corner, but after meeting with the Columbus Flyers Club, we've really spread it out through the entire southern portion of that park, and that allows us to have some, some longer disc golf holes that uh, are a little closer to the traditional 18 course layout. Again, we'll kind of get into it a little further. The pavilion area in the very center, just to the um, upper right of the pond, has also been enhanced with uh, the splash pad and then additionally a playground adjacent to it to really kind of enhance this node and activate the central, uh, central spot of this park. Uh, because we've added a playground adjacent to the splash pad, which will really activate that area, we have shifted the nature play a little further north. Uh, we've also included a perimeter path that is actually going to get up to 1.7 miles around the whole park, which will be really nice. Uh, as, as well as included some tennis courts adjacent to the uh, proposed basketball courts near the pavilion in the center there. So that's what's been updated uh, in the last uh, six months, nine months that we've been going through this, this process. And from this, we then go, went into 30% design documents. Um, we took all of that and we dug into these various areas shown on the next graphic uh, and the enlargement areas within those areas to about a 30% design. So we've really designed out this whole park uh, in a little more detail. Uh, I'm going to focus more on the phase one improvements than the rest of the design areas, but I did want to touch on that we have kind of gone through this for the entire park. Yeah, and Ash Ashley's go just going to do some highlights here because it'll take us a while to get through all 22 pages. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and right now we're in the process, the city, our team from the city is currently reviewing some of that, Donna and her team. Uh, and it, based on feedback from you guys, and then we'll finalize that set, and we'll talk about next steps at the end of the presentation. So, included in the phase one limits uh, currently, we this has changed a little bit since um, we presented last fall, but it is pretty true to the same types of elements that we had at that point. So, we have now included the disc golf course, which isn't shown in the limits shown on your screen, actually. It was kind of hard to include them because it's kind of spread out over all, the whole south side, but know that that is included in phase one, proposed phase one currently, and the estimate. Um, that, along with the mini roundabout, is still included, and the entry drive that leads to the dog park and adjacent parking lot. So this is this clip is a um, shown from our 30% design set. It's in the lower southeast corner of the park, 
And there's not too many improvements happening here. I know you guys have an existing prairie that's really nice that people like to walk through. But we do have some disc golf holes going through this area. So there will be some selective clearing that goes along with that to open up um, the course. But uh, included in each disc golf hole is a concrete pad on one end and the basket, of course, on the other. Uh, and then clearing in between. And we really have been able to incorporate a very wide range of distances for each hole, which uh, based on feedback from Columbus Flyers Club is what is preferred in an 18 hole disc golf course. So shown here is really the, the front nine of the disc golf course that you could loop around and actually if you're more of a beginner and don't want to do the whole 18 course, then you could actually loop back to the parking lot after this, the proposed parking lot future. Um, and the Columbus Flyers come seem very excited based on the proposed layout that it would, a lot of these holes cross a lot of different environments, a prairie, some forested areas, some lawn areas, which seems like a really um, great amenity for a disc golf course and uh, would actually be one of the better disc golf courses they, they tell us in, um, in central Ohio. So also included in phase one, the mini roundabout and entry drive, uh, we've kind of looked at these areas in a little more detail. Again, this is a clip from our 30% design set. It does show the, the community uh, garden expansion and some of that parking that would not currently be included with the phase one improvements um, as spec, but the entry drive and mini roundabout would be. So we've actually had our engineers take a look at this, make sure every, all the turning radii actually work for large delivery trucks because the plan would be that the tomato festival would eventually be uh, hosted here. So we need to make sure some of those larger trucks can, can get in and get out. In the next phase, the fire department would need to review this and make sure it works for their access and their needs. Um, and throughout the design, we've really strived in all portions to make sure the layout avoids as many existing trees and existing infrastructure as possible. For example, this mini roundabout in the entry drive does avoid the existing um, basketball courts that are out there. Eventually, those would need to be removed for the rest of the future improvements and shifted uh, to the west. But for that first phase, we would be able to leave them in there. Okay, so digging into the dog park design and adjacent parking lot. So as I mentioned, we've gone from a one acre dog park to a 4.5 acre dog park, which again would be one of the larger dog parks in central Ohio, which would be great. This also has a lot of amenities that would make this really a great destination dog park for, um, for residents. So we have two large dog, large dog areas shown and they're fenced off kind of in the center with a double gate that could remain open most of the time uh, and dogs could run between there. But we do that because if there's any maintenance needed on one side of the park or the other, then you can gate that off, reseed, all of that, all of that good stuff if necessary. We have a small dog area shown to the upper left near the uh, drop off with actually a shelter that would straddle the fence in between so that people using the small dog or the large dog could um, use that for shelter and um, a seating area. In that kind of main node under the shelter is where we would propose the wash area and water fountain that um, could be used to kind of wash off your dogs. It's a little muddy out there before you leave, um, giving them a cup of water, et cetera. And near the drop off area, we have a portion shown that could be where um, a portable restroom area could be located in porta potties. Um, but that would be a temporary kind of solution. So, and then a, also an agility course at the end of that drop off there, kind of at the um, right between the two large dog areas where people could work on training, et cetera. Um, and the parking lot as proposed is about 50 parking spaces. Um, and if in the future there was needed to be overflow, there is shown off of this graphic just to the north, another parking area where people could also park for the dog park, but again, that would not be phase one. That would be a future future phase. Okay, so digging in to the phase one er estimate for just the areas that we, we kind of went over. Um, <clears throat> and I think I actually forgot to mention in that phase one, a partial detention pond will be required. We would put it in the location um, where the future kind of enlarged central pond would be. 
uh, but it would be just a partial one for now based on the added pavement that's needed and things like that for stormwater. So in our previous estimate for phase one, we were coming in at about a million dollars, but our current estimate is at 2.5 uh, million with the enhancements that we just discussed. There has been some added features, um, the dog park size and complexity, which I kind of went over. There's also been some other design elements that as we got into the design development, we realized that we will need, um, including some concrete curbs along the entry drive, uh, a water line, we'll need to enlarge the water line tap, which is right under the proposed entry drive, and that'll need to be enlarged for some of the future improvements, including the splash pad and some irrigation for some of those fields. Uh, the Frisbee Golf has also been added, um, and then, of course, we would also like to note that, as I'm sure many of you are aware, there's been a lot of construction cost increases that we've seen over the last six months. Uh, and on top of all of that, we do have a 20% contingency for 30% design. So, next steps, um, and we can kind of come back to questions about all that stuff, of course. Um, right now, we just... At the beginning of the year, we got through topic article survey, which is um, done by emh &T, which was our task one of this contract. Task two included uh, in community engagement and master, plans re master plan revisions, which have been complete and we went over. Um, task three is almost complete, that design development 30% set that I discussed. We are just waiting on any feedback that everyone has and we can update that as well as EMH&T is finalizing some of the utility master plan and stormwater master planning. And then task four, once phase one is finalized um, and the design set is approved, we will be, we are contracted to move into final engineering and construction documents just for the phase one portion of the park. So with that, um, covered a lot. <laughs> But is there any kind of questions on the design or the estimate or um, the phase one improvements? Before we jump yes. into questions, okay. I'll take the financial questions. Um, <laughs> just throwing that out there. Um, and again, also, you know, please keep in mind that this is still, you know, this is part of the design phase. Nothing is actually written in stone, but we'll kind of get into that. But if you have specific questions about some of the overall qualities and some of the things that you saw in phase one, um, please feel free and ask the consultants. And then after you're done with that, then I'll talk about the things that you all really want to ask about is how we're paying for it. Council Member Strickland, please. So great presentation, um, Ashley and Mark. So thank you so much. We are excited about um, the possibilities that can happen in Civic Park. So thank you. Um, I will leave the questions regarding the financial piece to the mayor, though. Um, what or how did you guys decide on, you know, that phase one, including the dog park, free speed, and things of that nature? Have you considered maybe another portion of the park where it may not be as expensive? Yes. <laughs> so if you so can that is still on the table. Um, phase one was kind of decided back in the fall, and from what I hear, uh, it was basically, we kind of wanted to make an impact with phase one, which this dog park would make a fantastic or be a fantastic amenity for the residents. But there's, of course, other options for phase one that could be discussed. Um, the dog park is difficult because it is on the far south side, and you do have to construct the entire entry drive and mini roundabout to get there, uh, which includes a lot of associated utilities. So we could discuss other portions of the park uh, being included in phase one, but that was the thought process at the time, is that would make the largest impact um, to start. Um, that's all I have for now. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Council Member Baker. Just real quick, I noticed on the mock-up, and I know it's just a mock-up for the small dark, dog section of it yep. is it possible to make it just a little bit bigger not because if you look at the large dog area yep. it's very huge and i mean it's just a picture maybe i'm just overlooking but just making a little yeah just a little bit bigger we could yeah. definitely do that yeah that's easy to do we kind of compared the different sizes there's actually a pizarro park in gahanna which mm -hmm. has a very similar um some of the same kind of areas i guess i'll call it um, but we can definitely make that a little larger, no problem. Do 
Do we have any other questions? A little overwhelming. <laughs> any financial okay. questions? Uh, yeah. Mayor Begany. All right. So um, let's kind of just take a couple of steps back. Um, so one of the things that we are looking at at Civic Park is uh, the idea that ultimately uh, the Tomato Festival would actually return to Civic Park. And so one of the things that was uh, looked at by emh &T was, um, you know, all right, if we were to bring the Tomato Festival back to that, let's plan for a park that actually could hold the type of festival, uh, what could be in there for the entirety. And so one of the things you look at in that is you're looking at some of the infrastructure. You're looking at can we get water to an area where you would have your fair food trucks? Uh, can you get electricity out to areas where there's a main stage or rides or some of those things? Um, those are not exciting things. Those are infrastructure things that need to be done and need to be addressed. And so a lot of what is in phase one does deal with that infrastructure, which again is not the most exciting. Um, that being said, it's phase one. This just happened to be something where we're starting it. And then, you know, the idea was moving kind of clockwise all the, west, uh, all the way around the rest of everything. Uh, so what we are planning on doing is uh, in consulting uh, with the auditor's office, uh, we've, we're going to be dedicating in our CIP, our capital improvement plan for next year, basically 500000 for next year, and then we're going to hold off on anything for phase one as of right now, and then add an additional $500,000 the next year after that for $1 million. That will give us kind of the ability to start building a nest egg. We do have the opportunity to use uh, TIF funds. Uh, one of the things that we included in the Rose Hill development was TIF funds that would actually be able to help fund part of the park. Uh, that would actually go up into excess of $2 million, and that amount right there would be taking a little bit of time to get there, but again, part of the process. Uh, the rest of it, um, and you'll hear a little bit later on, uh, grant funding for uh, different avenues to reach money from the federal level, from the state level, local level, everything all the way around. There are certain things where you're not going to get the entirety of the park, but maybe you're going to have something where you get the playground taken for, or maybe you get something else to do. We'll also utilize economies of scale with our street program when it comes into looking at, you know, building that little, the entryway, wherever it may be, or additional parking as part of a street program, because that way, instead of having one separate pile going just specifically to Civic, now it's part of our overall street program, so that way the money spreads a little bit easier, because you're buying more of the material all the way across. Uh, and earlier today, I had a meeting with a representative of Congresswoman Beatty's office, and we did discuss Civic Park in, uh, in detail. And so, again, we do have her support in uh, finding federal funds all the way throughout there. Uh, this is not a one-year, two-year thing, and then Civic Park gets done. This, this is, you know, a, a decade-plus investment into making Civic Park, the, you know, an incredibly well-utilized park all the way throughout. Um, that's kind of the, the approach that we've gone with it. Um, as you saw, the original estimate was, yay, $1 million. Hey, we can do that. And then everything else kind of changed. Uh, a lot of it, again, is, you know, the increase in size of the dog park and some of, the, some of the other amenities. Some of it is due to the infrastructure that needs to be put in to provide for future growth all the way throughout and for safety purposes. Uh, and then a lot of it, uh, the rest of it is the materials cost increase. So we have to be very specific with that, and we have to take it slow and steady to make sure that we're doing things the right way. Because what we don't want to do is we don't want to, let's say, if we wanted to, we could build the dog park now. We could do that for next year. We won't have the road to get there. You won't have the infrastructure to deal with it. And then all of a sudden, it's just, that's not the best way to do it. I'd rather, if we're going to be moving into Civic Park, let's do this thing right and make sure that it is perfect. Um, we did also bring in just a couple of other things. We did talk about the overall park scheme. We brought in Chief Sharps from uh, Turo Township. So we talked about fireworks setups and all of that stuff is included in this idea. So we're really planning ahead. Um, the Parks and Rec Department, uh, Jennifer Clemens and I, we all went out to Civic Park and put our imagine, imagine glasses on and tried to figure out where where would a main stage be? Where would an auxiliary stage be for the community band or other concerts that could happen outside of a, a major event? What would it all look like? How would we all plan it out? Because we're trying to, again, think far enough ahead that this thing is going to be something that will be open. Uh, the same thing when we talked about um, the, uh, the, the turf system for those with limited mobility. How do we make sure that we have that available for those students, uh, for those uh, people that are of limited mobility but can still participate in athletics uh, all the way throughout? Trying to take into it. Um, we gathered a lot of feedback. Um, I think Director Bauman had, what, about 10 years' worth of uh, community suggestions, uh, followed by a number of meetings uh, that Councilwoman Strickland, you and I were in attendance at uh, a number of them in Civic Park itself. We did things at the farmer's market. And so we basically 
threw everything at it and said, this is what the community is looking for that has been very vocal about such things. Pop, give it. And then about 15 iterations later, what you see tonight is the most recent version of everything. Uh, that we, again, do expect that there'll be changes as we move forward. But this is kind of an introduction to what it's going to be. And the key word with all of this is going to be patience. Uh, and we want to make sure that we do this right. Council Member Savavi. <clears throat> I don't really have a question, but I just wanted to make a comment um, sort of in support of the, the, cho the choice of this being phase one. Um, because one of the things that I think I don't know, to me, that's been a little bit downplayed, not by certain people, but by, uh, is, is the Frisbee golf part of this. Um, as a person who 20-something <clears throat> years ago um, <laughs> played a lot of Frisbee golf, um, I know I hear on social media and whatnot how much this area needs things for kids to do, and specifically things for kids to do that don't cost a lot of money. This is perfect. I mean, this is something kids can walk to. It's exercise. A couple Frisbees might be $20, $30. It, it could be as little as 10 if you just get one Frisbee, but nobody that plays Frisbee golf gets one Frisbee. But, um, <laughs> so, but it, it's inexpensive. It's a time sink. It takes time. Any kid can do it. Any adult can do it. And it's, it's, in, the, it's in the sunshine. It's cheap. So, I mean... I'd love to see this sooner rather than later. I know that's not, you know, not realistic, but to me it should be phase one because this is something that people, to me in Reynoldsburg, have been calling for for a long time. Well, I think that uh, we'll definitely continue to kind of, you know, move forward with this process. Uh, and, you know, after tonight, obviously this is the first time that council and the general public have seen the most recent iteration. I know they've seen a lot of different versions that were, I would say very similar to, but just enough differences here and there. Uh, so we'll make sure to get this out on our website um, so that way people can comment there. I know there's a number of Facebook groups out there that will be curious to see what happens with it. Uh, and that will also allow uh, you know, my office to continue working with various agencies to find ways to br bring about as much funding as possible in on this. And so we do appreciate, uh, appreciate uh, all the comments, and we'll take it in. And again, for those of you watching at home or even for members of council, nothing is written in stone as far as what is or is not phase one. Outside of the unfortunate thing that is the most, um, I don't know, it's the most difficult thing, and we're kind of living with this on Main Street right now, is it's the infrastructure that is the most important piece because we have to start with that great foundation to build that. And so the infrastructure is probably going to be the first, regardless of what area it is, that infrastructure is, is important because what we don't want to do is we don't want to put something in and then have to dig it up just to put in, you know, the best, the power lines that we need or the water lines that we need. We want to get that stuff done so that way when everything else is set, we're ready to go and to rock and roll at the Tomato Festival if it does indeed return. Councilwoman Strickland. So thank you, Madam President. So um, I just want to make sure on record, um, we talk about young people, you know, having an opportunity to join um, or come to the parks at low cost. You know, and the, one of the reasons why I asked the question was because a splash pad to me would be one of the number one things to get family out there, right? Um, and, and so that's why I was just trying to have a better understanding on how that phase was coming and what was being included. So, um, but thank you both. For the information, um, it's a lot to unpack. It's, it's good information, though. So thank you. Any other questions or comments? If there's anything else at any time, if you want to meet with uh, the team, you know, I, I assume we'll be meeting again in the not too distant future. Having things, we're more than happy to have uh, any members of council included. And for those of you watching at home, and I know I've seen a couple of comments already on the feed, uh, we'll get you the information and you're more than happy to share suggestions and comments all the way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have a mid-year financial presentation by the auditor's department. President Jenkins, members and council. Uh, last November, Joni Crawford, our finance manager, and Laura Gishel, our tax administrator, and I, we reported to council our 2022 revenue projections. 
we included potential key tax revenue influences for the general fund, estimates for tax revenues from our top employers whose business models had changed to permanently a work from home environment or a hybrid model, a potential 2021 remote work location refund requests, and an income tax review impacted uh, projected timeline. As a result, what we have added is a new monthly financial data comparison report to your packets once a month uh, so that this body and the administration can see the data that we see and make sound fiscal decisions. Um, what we are going to show you tonight is a 2022 cumulative uh, revenue for January through June. And it's um, general fund unencumbered balance report um, and withholding tax results and a revenue concerning our projections made last November. And with that, I'm going to bring up our uh, fiscal finance manager, Joni Crawford. Good evening, council members, council president, mayor, and uh, attorney Shook. Um, last time that we were up here, we kind of, um, in November, we gave you some news that we thought, you know, might not be so good so that we could look forward in the future and, and see where we're going to end up. And we said we'd be back here in six months and we'd see how it is. So here we're back here in six months and, and happy to say things don't look as bad as we anticipated. So, yay. Um, so one of the first uh, things I think is included in your package was a cumulative revenue report from January to June. So you'll see in the green was the amount of revenue that went to um, the general fund and you'll see each month, um, you know, it gradually increased. We didn't have any dips. Um, overall, our year to date revenue is about a million dollars higher than it was last year at this time. Um, so, you know, we're holding our own. We're doing good with that. Um, of the 14.9 million year-to-date revenue that we've received in the general fund, 12.9 of that is income tax revenue, which Lori will give you uh, more detail on, on where that revenue came from, either withholding or net profit tax. Um, we've done a great job of keeping our expenditures in line. Our expenditures are about $2 million less than they were last year, so, um, you know, um, the mayor has made a commitment to kind of keep things in line the first half of the year to see how we're doing and then gradually, you know, start paying for, you know, getting some of the things that we hope to get done this year. So all in all, I'd say that right now we're looking good. Um, I don't know, I don't have the, the, the glass ball to tell me what the future holds. Um, probably Lori can give you a better idea of that with the um, income tax revenue. But right now our revenue is, is looking good. Our fund balance is looking good. Um, one of the sheets that was included in your package gave you a um, percentage of the fund balance as to the whole budget. And um, it's about, um, our fund balance makes up about 67% of our budget. And our cash policy, um, our goal is to keep it at 25% of the budget. So we're at a great place with that. So, um, you know, we're happy to report that things are are looking better than we anticipated and hopefully the year will end up that way. Um, does anyone have any questions? Right, well, I'd just like to say thank you for all the, the directors and um, everyone for doing a great job of keeping things in line and we'll just keep going in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other communications? Thank you. I didn't see it on the screen. Good evening. Uh, again, thank you for having us. Uh, thank you for your patience. As we work through this, um, we're going to still ask for additional patience. Because um, I think as you probably are hearing, even from neighboring communities, um, we're just uh, going through uh, uncharted territory at this time. Um, we're not sure where things are going. Um, I would like to share a few things with you just to kind of give you an idea. Um, because of confidentiality, 
Uh, there's certain things I cannot share, but if things have already been reported in the newspapers or the like, um, we can also gather facts for that that will help us um, as we go forward um, in this pro in this new these new times or this new era, if you if you will. Um, as uh, Joni stated, um, we're very happy to report that things aren't quite as grim as we had anticipated. Um, we are not yet out of the woods, but I said the good news is, is if it's um, good luck or by the grace of God, we have had a few things happen to us since in this past six months. Um, the chart that is in your packet, I don't know if we have that to put up on the screen. Um, the withholding tax collection comparison, 11 of um, our top 20 employers, that should have been in your packets, is the same chart that we provided you back in November of last year. Um, we intentionally wanted to provide that same information to you so that you could see now where we're at. Of those top 11 employers, this last column here, is the 2022 annual estimate now using the first six months of the year of our actual receipts. And if we project out the next six months, we actually are coming within $17,000 of our target. Meaning that we estimated that we were gonna lose from just those top, those 11 employers, we were going to lose from this work from home shift just over $5 million annually. And that's gonna be a permanent hit to our revenue. It's going away, it's gone, and where, it, what it's stemming from is people that were at our large employers that are now working from home in other taxing jurisdictions. So their tax revenue now, the employer's no longer withholding and remitting it to Reynoldsburg, yet they're withholding it and re remitting it to um, their resident community. Um, to help minimize this impact, the tax department is monitoring our top withholders um, on a regular basis. Um, every single uh, time we get a distribution from Rita, I'm looking at that. I'm in regular communication with the mayor, with Stephen, um, on that. Part of Two, what we see, as you may know, and part of monitoring our top employers, some of you may have seen July 12th, there was a Columbus Dispatch article, Victoria's Secret announced that they were cutting 160 management positions for the purposes of, um, at the Reynoldsburg headquarters, um, in an effort to unite their three lines, which is Victoria's Secret, Pink, and Beauty, into one, in doing so, they're now minimizing the management um, and it's going to save them $40 million. 2.5, Reynoldsburg's tax rate times 40 million is a million dollar loss to the city. So we have that now coming. Um, if there's good news to come out of that, <laughs> a part of that million dollars has already been calculated into this $5 million loss. Now, there still will be some loss from that, but it won't be the full $1 million that we now have to add on to that um, based off of that announcement. Um, we're also monitoring other top Central Ohio um, employers um, hoping to get that residency tax. Um, we're trying to look at those that are close to us, such as DFAS. Um, you may have heard Nationwide plans to shrink their 20 physical offices down to four. Um, Hopefully, some of those employees work in Reynolds or live in Reynoldsburg. Um, PwC announced they're laying, uh, they have 40,000 employees in the U.S. that will now be virtual um, for the unforeseeable future. So we're monitoring all those, trying to see where are there other ways that we can kind of recover some of this money. Um, another piece of this was our E zone. We had a 15-year agreement. Um, with the uh, Licking Heights School District, and it was thought that that was to expire within the next three to five years, um, so it wasn't really budgeted. Um, we didn't really um, had budgeted for that, and through this process and looking and doing this estimate for you in November, 
um, I had determined and then worked with Attorney Shook that we believe that that expiration was actually 1231 of 21. We could not share that with you back in November because at that time we were still working with the district to finalize um, the end of that agreement. But that particular agreement last year, the revenue um, is $1.6 million annually. That will all now be coming, where we shared that before, that will all be coming to um, the city. So for this year, um, it will equate to about 1.2 million, I think was the estimate, and then go forward, it would be 1.6, probably plus, depending on how the businesses within that in the E-Zone district um, report their profits and, and so forth and their employees. Um, I've also been um, fortunate because the unprecedented and basically what is right now saving us from this being so grim and that five million because we have lost that five million and that's what that chart was to show you is that employee change did happen that employer withholding change did happen but we have like other municipalities in Ohio we are reporting unprecedented net profit uh, revenues this year um, most of the ones that I've talked to in here in Central Ohio are double digits we're actually three digits now we just received um, an extra four, I will say extra, <laughs> four million dollars this past month um, that we w don't normally receive, but we've received it. Um, I've had the conversations with the mayor and the auditor. That particular, those monies are not yet, we don't classify them as ours until such time that the businesses file their final tax returns. It would be much like you as an individual, you make estimated payments, and then at the end of the year, you true that up once you file your final return. So we're waiting on those companies to file the final returns. Once that happens, we can then safely say, yes, that's our money to then be able to spend or, or do with which, which, what we need. So I think that's all I have for you, unless you have questions. Council Member Baker. I don't have a question, but I just want to give credit where credit is due. I'd like to thank you. and especially uh, Joni Crawford for all the hard work that you two have done to keep us informed and the city informed about where our finances are. And I'm glad to hear that we are ahead of the curve instead of behind the curve. And I'd like to thank you, um, Mr. Mayor, for all the hard work you've done to make sure that we stay above the curve for a change instead of talking about what we can't do because we don't have the money. I remember some years ago, that's all I heard was we can't do this because we don't have the money, we don't have the money, we don't have the money. But now we do have revenue coming in, consistent revenue coming in, and I like to give credit where credit is due. So thank you. We appreciate that. And again, we appreciate your patience. And um, as we continue to um, move forward, we will keep all of you apprised of any fluctuations. We have a great team here. We, we really do. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll move forward with our motions. A motion to approve a resolution authorizing the mayor to apply for funding from the Ohio Public Works Commission for the Wagner Road Phase 2 Priestley Drive to East Broad Street Improvement Project. Mayor Begany. Yes, Madam President, members of council, um, it is that time again uh, to uh, work with the Ohio Public Works Commission uh, for grant funding. Uh, as you recall, about a year ago, we applied for phase one, uh, which I'm happy to say is uh, moving forward. Uh, the phase one will start in August of 2023, and so we're at the point right now where we have to prepare our application for phase two. Phase two will be approximately from Priestley Drive to Broad Street, uh, encompassing all of the same bells and whistles as uh, phase one, which includes sidewalks, multi-purpose paths, uh, some lane widening in certain areas um, all the way throughout. Um, <clears throat> obviously, we've gotten a lot of support from 
Franklin County Engineer's Office, uh, MI Homes, uh, which will be part of this, that's in this area where they're located at, uh, as well as any other future development to kind of work through there, including things like Pine Quarry Park and things of that nature. Uh, so we would like your permission to go ahead and apply for this grant. Um, this is kind of an interesting, it's going to be not as intense in certain regards because of just the location and things, but at the same time, you know, you're still looking at right-of-way acquisition and things like that. Uh, but we're very hopeful uh, that we figured out the first way to do it, and we'll go ahead and get phase two under the way. Um, and uh, thank you for your support on this. Do we have any questions or comments? May I have a motion to approve this resolution? So moved. Give it to Lou. Council Member Savati, is there a second? Second. Council Member Baker, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. Next, we have a motion to approve a resolution authorizing the mayor to apply for a grant with raise for improvements to the Bryce Road corridor. Mayor Begany. Again, Madam President, um, I do spend time uh, looking online and trying to be aware of grants that are available. And this one is uh, an interesting one. At first glance, it did not seem that it would be something that we would be eligible for. <clears throat> Um, normally when you look at grants, they have a dollar amount that is a maximum. This one actually had a dollar amount that was a minimum. Basically what the federal government is saying, if your project is not at least this big, don't bother applying. Uh, so that's what the raise grant is. Um, we were looking to figure out where this would be the most beneficial to the city. And ultimately we felt that Bryce Road would be the, uh, the number one location. Uh, so I'm going to go over a little bit of information for you as far as the timeline, because this is not like the OPWC grant. This is something that goes through the federal government, so there's a lot of layers to this. Um, it starts off with a timeline. Uh, we hope to present to you some legislation in September to work with uh, Baker Tilly, which is actually our bonding uh, firm, but they also do work in grants. Because of the complexity of this particular issue uh, and what is required, whether it's everything through environmental, housing, um, affordability, things like that, uh, we needed to have uh, somebody else that's got the, the professional ability to write that grant. So there is legislation or there is the co uh, contract that is actually attached to this legislation to look through. That will be on for appropriation when we get back from recess. The goal is to start work on this process and get everything reviewed uh, by the city and by uh, Breaker Tilly by December with a final submission in April to make sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. But the most important thing is the scope of work that would happen with this. Um, it would start off at the corner of Bryce and Maine, which would include the realignment of that intersection. Uh, so that way it would actually be straight through. <clears throat> we would also include storm and sewer upgrades all the way throughout from that intersection all the way to the Livingston area. We would have signal replacements you know, for traffic lights as well as pedestrian crossing that is coincided with what comes up at Bryce Park as well as the uh, new library as well as the Alliance Project. So we'll be coordinating all of these different entities to make sure that we maximize the dollar value and maximize the pedestrian access. Uh, we Other options that will be in there include uh, the bicycle path all the way throughout, uh, some other connectivity. Uh, and we're looking at some limited power line burial in that area as well, just to kind of open that up uh, for everything. Uh, the cost right now, and again, this is a back of the napkin based on what the prices were, say, two weeks ago. Uh, the cost is going to be anywhere between 8 to $10 million. Uh, my guess is it'll be slightly more than that. However, uh, it's an 80-20 split, meaning that the federal government will pick 80, up 80% of the cost. The city of Reynoldsburg will be resp uh, responsible for the other 20%. But if we time this just right, and we think we have, that OPWC contract that we're going for for Wagner Road Phase 2, by the time we're ready for raise and we've met all the federal obligations, we could actually use the OPWC grant in a couple of years to apply to either pay in the entirety or more likely a very large portion of our 20% share. So that is the, the timing essence of everything. So just to kind of give you an idea, 2021, um, you know, we applied for the Wagner Road, Road Phase 1. 2022, we're going to apply for Wagner Road Phase 2. 23, we are looking at Summit Road. And then 24 would be Bryce Road, which means that construction would actually start in 2025, which is exactly what the timeline is for the raise grant to go through. So even though right now it's July of 2022, you're looking at an incredibly long process to get all the way throughout there. Again, Baker Tilly comes highly recommended. They are experts in the field, and there's a lot of pieces with it. Um, could we do this ourselves? Yeah, we could. Um, could we do it as good as what they're going to do and with their familiarity of uh, doing grants like this in the past that have been successful? It's one of those things. For a, for a project this size and for what Bryce Road means to the city of Reynoldsburg, uh, we, we have to give it our best shot. 
Um, so you'll see legislation on that as we continue to uh, work our way through the corridor all the way throughout. Uh, so with that, I hope for your support tonight to uh, get this next project going as we start looking forward to 2025. Are there any questions or comments? May I have a motion to approve this resolution? Council Member Baker, may I have a second? Second. Council Member Lawson Rowe, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. Next, we have a motion to authorize the Clerk of Council to return any liquor permit request received during the August recess to mark without a request for hearing. As long as the Reynoldsburg Police Department finds no reason for a hearing while Council is in recess for the month of August 2022, should a hearing be necessary, a special Council meeting will be called. This motion is for housekeeping purposes to effectively resolve any liquor permits submitted during the recess that Chief Baker's investigation determines <coughs> are acceptable. Are there any questions or comments from Council? May I have a motion to approve this resolution? So moved. Council Member Baker, is there a second? Second. Council Member Pecorell, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? The motion carries. Next, we have a motion to recess the Reynoldsburg City Council for the month of August 2022. This motion is also for housekeeping purposes to approve Council's August recess. Should the administration deem it necessary to call, a, call Council back into session for a special meeting, please contact Clerk Prasher to determine the earliest possible meeting date. Are there any questions or comments from Council? May I have a motion to approve this resolution? So moved. Council Member Strickland, is there a second? Second. Council Member Pacarell, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The motion carries. Next, we have reports. The auditor's report. Clerk Prasher, please. The auditor's office submitted the budget by department and classification for the month of June 2022. And the clerk of court report. The Clerk of Court submitted monies collected from the courts held in May in the amount of $21,656. Thank you. Clerk of Court report, Clerk Prasher. I just did that so one that too. That was it. Okay. <laughs> Next, we have Development Parks and Recreation Committee. That would be Council Member Baker. Thank you, Madam President. This is the Development Park and Recreation Committee meeting for July 25th, 2022. Members in attendance are Councilmember Cotton, Councilmember Lawson Rome, Councilmember Packer, myself, and you, Madam President. Uh, we have, uh, I believe, three items on our agenda. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the ordinance to amend the, the official zoning map for the city of Reynoldsburg for a property located at 8555 East Main Street from Innovation District to Community Commercial District. Uh, Director Myers. Uh, good evening. Can you folks hear me okay? Great. Thank you. I have a tendency to mumble, so we're using the hand mic to <coughs> get past that. So thank you. Um, so um, this past Thursday, we had a planning commission meeting. Um, at that meeting, um, the project is mentioned, which is rezoning application uh, 2022-5172. <coughs> um, planning commission voted 3-1. Uh, concerning the factors of section 1109.23 G of the zoning code to recommend that the application um, come forth back to City Council and be approved for rezoning. Um, this is the um, area at Taylor and Main. Um, part of it is proposed to be a sheet. It's about four acres of approximately the 17 acres property. Um, at this meeting, um, I am not looking for a vote. I am looking simply for uh, City Council to um, approve sending this to our September meeting, which is when we would come back from recess. Um, at that point, there would be a vote, and um, if you folks were so inclined, as well as it would be posted for public hearing. So I'm simply reporting the recommendation back from Planning, uh, planning Commission, which was a 3-1 recommendation in favor of the rezoning and asking um, that you folks vote to uh, hear this at your next meeting in September. Okay, any questions from the committee? For Director Myers, any from Council? Uh, yes, Councilman Pacro. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's my understanding that some of the concerns that are brought by the residents are addressed by now, right? Uh, yes, my understanding is that nearly all of the, well, I should say nearly all of the residents have, have moved out. I believe there's maybe two or three left. Um, as far as 
um, notice and, and things of that nature. My understanding in working with uh, City Attorney Shook is that they've now followed the appropriate notice procedures and things that they're um, the property owner is legally required to. Um, um, in terms of getting into those more details, I'm at the next meeting. Um, I'm sure the developer will be here, uh, Skilkin. They're here now, but we haven't invited them to speak. But to the third meeting, they'd be happy to get into those specific details if you um, so wish. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? I'm just going to say I'm going to reserve my questions for when the developer is up here. I, I would just add to you. Um, to be fair to the developers here, but we're um, due to um, public notice requirements and things like that, the appropriate forum and how um, this is to be handled is to do the public hearing at the at the next meeting uh, in September. Um, Attorney Shook, you wanna? Oh yes, um, one thing just to add. Um, one, I would say the substantive difference between, um, as, as you folks may remember, this was before you last fall, um, there was not a formal vote on it. Um, the, Substantive difference, uh, it's it's pretty much the same um, project. In fact, it, it really is, except the uh, there's a, a condition on here. Um, we had a traffic study done this time, which was not done previously. Um, basically, as part of it, it, it identified the need for a, a turn lane on Taylor Road. Um, in addition to kind of what was prescribed in the study and in, in um, concurrence with it, the the uh, developer agreed to put a condition um, on the rezoning request, which is that uh, the applicant shall grant the city of Reynoldsburg sufficient right of way to allow for a dedicated right turn lane extending north along Taylor, Taylor Road to Main Street, adjacent to the parcel. Um, between now and the next meeting, their site plan will be modified to represent that um, condition. So we're I'm working with our city engineer, you mentioned here right now to get that put together to then formally send uh, those requirements to uh, Skilkin, who's the developer, to, to make that um, get in there. And between now and September, that should be plenty of time to make those adjustments and get those um, before you folks. Uh, does that um, sufficiently address the condition that you wanted, uh, Attorney Shook? Okay. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and make the motion that we forward this ordinance on the council for a second reading. Correct. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Packer. Any further discussion? Okay. Seeing then all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Okay. okay. Motion carries. It will be forwarded on the council for a second reading. Um, second item. Yeah. I'm Second item for discussion, sir, I was about to skip the third one. An ordinance accepting, approving, and ratifying the submitted recommendations of several city, several city of Reynoldsburg TAC initiative review councils. Director Meyer. Yes, yeah, so right now the city um, has five existing TIFs, and what we have to do is every year we report um, on the TIFs for the previous year. So um, we have TIFs in three counties, so um, we, myself, um, city staff, uh, the auditor, uh, Sisak, his team, and I um, briefed all three counties on the status of the, the TIFs, um, the recommendations, and what's included in the minutes for that, for every TIF we have currently in existence to continue them going forward and to continue monitoring them. Um, so the recommendations are all, you know, positive. Please, you know, keep it going forward and report back next year as we're required to do. So this is simply just accepting those recommendations we have a after we meet and, and do that we have a certain period of time to basically send the recommendations to you folks to have you vote on them so um, that's what we're doing here but again it was all positive for all five and just keep them in place and keep monitoring them and um, go through the same process that we have been since these five tests have been created so simply just asking for uh, for you to um, vote on you know moving it forward for a for a uh, next reading and uh, at the uh, September City Council meeting. Okay. Any questions from the committee? Any from council? Okay, seeing none, um, I'll go ahead and make the motion that before this ordinance on the council for its first reading, is there a second? Second. Second by Councilwoman Lawson Rowe. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 And all those opposed? Okay, we'll move on. 
for a first reading. Uh, the last item on the agenda is the ordinance to appropriate funds from various accounts in the Economic Development Department and declare an emergency. Director Myers. Okay, so this is an emergency request um, for me. Uh, this is a situation as you've you know seen in um, your jobs or you know looking around uh, the the fight or the market for talent out there right now is really hot. Um, so our um, former planning zoning administrator Aaron uh, left the city for a um, for the private sector for a substantive raise that we couldn't even attempt to match. Um, so. Um, we posted looking for some um, to see what was out there to fill a position in the short term. Um, there was not a candidate we felt was sufficient. So um, what I'm proposing to do is to um, use OHM and EMH and T as our interim planning services um, for the remainder of this year. And what how I would be paying for that is simply taking not all, but some of the money that was going to Aaron's salary and wages and simply transferring from that bucket of funds to my engineering and architecture, so I'm not increasing my department's budget or anything like that. I'm simply moving money from one bucket to another, um, as I'm required to do. Um, so that is what I'm looking to do, and you know, my intent would be to still fill that position, but in the interim, this was the best solution. The, the folks um, that we'd be tapping into have decades of planning experience and are very competent and, and do a pretty good job. But So that's the nature of the emergency is simply um, you know, she left relatively recently. We we looked around and posted. We went through that process and didn't feel like we had our needs met. So with um, a lot of cases coming up and you folks going to recess in August, that's the reason for the emergency. And just for some background, um, I'm the development director. I I know a little bit of planning and zoning. I know some economic development. I'm not a planner by trade, so I really, although we have a great MORPC intern, Brandon, I'm really looking for some additional horsepower just help me for the rest of this year. So that's what the intent is for this ordinance, moving money from one bucket to the other, and that's the reason for the emergency request. Okay. Any questions from the committee? Any from council? Yes, Councilwoman Strickland. Thank you, um, Councilmember Baker. Um, so thank you for that information. So I know you're saying for the remainder part of the year, when, are, when do you plan on looking for a replacement? Like, Will that person be ready to come January? I just don't want to get in this, you know, um, place where we have to continue using the vendor. So. Um, a very good question. My intent would be to post in, in late fall to have somebody hopefully on board by beginning of the year. I will say typically, um, for good or bad, towards the end of the year, that's when you get a lot of the planning cases because everybody is trying to get in and get approvals or, I guess, disapprovals before the new year. So the nice thing is the, the workload at least, and you know, don't hold me to this, but typically the workload is a little bit earlier at the beginning of the year. So I should hopefully get a lot of these cases off the docket, get them through, and then we'd have a good ramp up. So yes, my, my intention would be to post later this year for this position so we're in good shape um, in January. Um, maybe not by January 1, but you know, close to that. Obviously, that's, that's my plan now. It is a little bit dependent on Again, what the job market looks like and things like that, but um, that is that is my intent, Councilwoman. Thank you. Um, and also, just wondering, have you thought about increasing the salary? Any? I will leave that to the budget process, and uh, um, um, I will make no comment on that, and, and uh, simply say we'll wait for the budget process to answer that question. And, and the only reason why I said that is because we have a lot of things going on, right? Um, and so we want to make sure we have someone that has the skill sets to be able to come in and do the work that we need. So, again, just putting it out there. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, just to kind of clarify, we, we, we do go through a process when we're evaluating for, uh, honestly, tomorrow is the first day that we're already talking about the budget for 2023. And one of the things that we do is we're a member of MORPSI, and they provide um, yearly salary staff schedules. And so what we do is we look at where the city of Reynoldsburg ranks uh, based on various departments. It could be anything from director level all the way down to, you know, seasonal parks and rec. It just, it, it varies all the way, but it provides an idea of where everyone is at. Uh, to give you an, uh, kind of an example is a number of years ago, uh, code enforcers uh, were uh, about one to two dollars per hour less for the city of Reynoldsburg than in most other municipalities. So we made those changes to do exactly what you said, uh, to find those top flight candidates all the way throughout. And 
while I believe you know this year as of right now, the salary schedule is relatively approximate based on what that particular cost is. I think we ran into an issue where it was in a, it's a unique job market right now. And um, but that being said, we always review all of those positions and we plan ahead. So that way, if we do need to make those salary changes, we get that stuff in legislation, you know, during the budget process before we even start basically putting the help wanted sign out. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make a note. You took my question. <laughs> nah, you get because, you know, to get the best, you got to pay. So I was going to ask that same question about the salary because it's all about the you know, it's all about the dollar. I would just add that, you know, the, the private sector the, is never going to be, or I should say the public sector is never going to be the same for the private sector. We get that. So it's never going to be comparable. Um, yeah. So I don't want to, I don't want to claim that, but, um, you know, I think, you know, the other part of this is just, you know, with what's going on, good or bad in the economy, I think things are going to kind of shake out and more, I would say kind of plateau or at least have a better, a greater degree of certainty or understanding how that's going in the next couple of months. So that's the, I would say, if you're looking for some silver linings, that's a, a good one too. So, all right. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion that we forward this ordinance on to council with emergency approval. Do I have a second? Second, second by council member Packerell. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Ayes have it. This will be moved on to council. Uh, for emergency approval. As there is no further business, uh, Madam President, back to you. Thank you. Next, we have Public Safety Law and Courts Committee, Council Member Lawson Rowe. Thank you, Madam President. This is the Public Safety Law and Court Committee meeting for July 25, 2022. Members in attendance are Council Member Kotner, Council Member Pacarau, myself, and you, Madam. President, item one, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a contract with the, with the Ohio Patrolman's Benevolent Association for a period beginning January 1, 2022 through December 31st, 2024, and declaring an emergency. This legislation is requested as a single read emergency. Mayor Begney. Uh, I will defer on this one, I believe, to City Attorney Shook. Is that for the Benevolent Association? So this is the uh, contract with the uh, Sergeants and Lieutenants Union, as oh. we previously discussed with Council. Sorry, I got Benevolent, and I was thinking it was something else. I apologize. This is the uh, information that was presented to Council. Um, in uh, executive session at our last meeting. This is uh, raises for our sergeants uh, with some promotional ability, uh, the implementation of an officer in charge program, as well as, uh, you know, the contract for the lieutenants. Okay. Are there any questions or comments from the committee on this legislation? Just for clarification, this is from January 1st, 2022, and we are doing this now. Is there any reason for that one? Yeah, sometimes negotiations take a little bit longer. Um, so the process usually starts off with the patrolmen's, uh, the, you know, the, I guess it's the patrol officer's contract. Uh, once that is completed, basically the sergeants and lieutenants look to see what uh, compensation the patrolmen get before we start negotiations with them. And then that process began. So this is the final phase of that. Uh, pay will be provided retroactively um, to those officers, uh, to the sergeants and the lieutenants from uh, January 1st, 2022. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the committee? From council? Okay, I move we forward this ordinance to council for emergency approval. Is there a second? Second. Second by council member Packerell. <coughs> any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> Motion carries. This ordinance will be forwarded to Council for Emergency Approval. Item two, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to sign a memorandum of understanding with the Franklin County Children's Services regarding investigations of child abuse and neglect in Franklin County and declaring an emergency. This legislation is being requested as a single read emergency. Uh, yes, uh, uh, 
Vice Chair uh, Lawson Rowe, this is a memorandum of understanding with the Franklin County Children's Services Department. Uh, we refer matters involving uh, children, whether it be uh, neglect, abuse, dependency, things of that nature, uh, for investigation to Children's Services. This agreement specifies the responsibilities of the parties, including the responsibilities here of city staff and of our police department uh, to make those reports and who to make those reports to so they can properly be investigated. The reason we're asking for a single read emergency on this is that we just received this MOU uh, from Franklin County a couple of weeks ago, um, and we need to get this approved before you guys go on break. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from the committee on this legislation? Again, one question for us. So um, this is Franklin County. What do we do the Lincoln County side of the city? Uh, Licking County, we have separate agreements with them. They have different durations, starting and stop times. Um, this is an agreement with Franklin County that with all the jurisdictions within the county, uh, they needed to update the MOU beginning July 1st of this year. Uh, for whatever reason, we didn't get the updated MOU. Actually, none of the jurisdictions did uh, until very recently. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions from council? I move we forward this ordinance to council for emergency approval. Is there a second? Second. Second by council member Pacquarao. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. This ordinance will be forwarded to council for emergency approval. Item three, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to sign a memorandum of understanding for the justice assistance grant for disparate funding agreements and declaring an emergency. This legislation is being requested as a single read emergency. Attorney Shook. I'll do my best with this one. This is a, uh, an ass a justice assistance grant that was applied for through the police department, awarded to the city of Reynoldsburg and to uh, the city of Whitehall and city of Columbus. Uh, essentially, we've been identified as uh, target communities for uh, disparate offenses of criminal activity. Um, and additional uh, funding associated with prosecution of those offenses. Are there any questions or comments from the committee on this legislation? From council? I move we forward this ordinance to council for an emergency approval. Is there a second? Second. Second by council member Pacquarao. Any other further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? This ordinance will be forwarded to council for emergency approval. As there is no further business in the Public Safety Laws and Courts Committee, I return the meeting to President Jenkins. Thank you. There is no Public Service and Transportation Committee meeting this evening. Next, we have Finance and Administration Committee. Council, Men council Member Savati, please. Thank you, President Jenkins. This is the Finance and Administration Committee meeting for July 25th, 2022. <clears throat> the members in attendance are Councilmember Baker, Councilmember Strickland, myself, and President Jenkins. Uh, first item on the agenda is an ordinance to amend Chapter 160, Section 160.02, Authorized Positions, Personnel, Classifications, and Pay Grade, uh, Section F, Police Department, Section 160.02, uh, G2, Service Department, Building Division, Section 160.03, uh, F, Other, and Section 160.04, uh, 3, Other Compensation, Tomato Festival Event Staffing Compensation for the City of Reynoldsburg, Ohio, and declaring an emergency. This ordinance has been brought back to the committee to be amended. Um, Attorney Shook, are you going to enumerate the amendments, or the uh, mayor is? Okay. Yes, uh, Chair Salvati, members of uh, the committee and council, um, this is actually a change for some clarification on the incentive for uh, employees to working for the tomato festival. The phraseology or the pattern hasn't changed, but the grammar has slightly to make it a little bit more clear to employees to differentiate between what is required for the personal day for working the tomato festival versus having almost, I don't want to call it a run-on sentence, but just provide some clarity all the way throughout. But the re remainder of all things stay the same. Great. Um, are there any questions or comments from the committee on the uh, amendments? Uh, Councilmember Strickland. 
Thank you, Chair Savali. So I noticed you, you input tomato festival event. What about the other events? Do they need to be also included that the personnel actually work during off hours? Uh, no, this is specifically just because this is uh, the tomato festival is our all hands on deck. Uh, there is another, there, is, there are no other events in the city require, in essence, almost every city employee to contribute in some way. So that's why it's just specifically for this event. Thank you. Though the way some of our events are going, we could easily see Juneteenth and the Pride Festival being the next two that come across, but we'll, we'll get there eventually. Okay, thanks. All right, any other questions from the committee? Any questions from the rest of council? All right. Um, I would like, I would move that we amend the ordinance to include the new language regarding additional employee benefits for working at the Tomato Festival. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Baker. Um, any last discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. The ordinance is amended. I now move we forward this ordinance to council for emergency approval. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Second from council member Strickland. Uh, any final discussion for that? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, that motion carries. And the ordinance as amended will be forwarded to council for emergency approval. Second item on the agenda is an ordinance appropriating funds from various funds to the Community Events Department. Um, Mayor. Well. Ch Chair Salvati, um, I neglected to include here on your list that this is also for uh, emergency approval. This is also for emergency approval. Thank you. Mayor. Thank you, everyone. Um, this is uh, basically, this is actually fun news. Um, this is where uh, the the event uh, Juneteenth collected over eight hundred and seventy, or collected exactly eight hundred and seventy-five dollars from the vendors that were participating, and uh, those funds will be actually presented to the African American Male Wellness Organization. And the Pride event uh, collected three hundred and twenty-five dollars from uh, the vendors that were there, and that is designated to the be donated to the Kaleidoscope Youth Center. So each one of these uh, events has a specific charity in mind, and this is just to make sure that everything is accounted for as the money comes into the city. And now we're ready to move on with it. Okay. Any questions or comments from the committee on this legislation? From the rest of council. All right, I move we forward this ordinance to council for emergency approval. Um, do I have a second? Second. S second from council member Strickland. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that ordinance is approved and we'll move forward to council for emergency approval. Uh, as there is no further business with the Finance Administration Committee, I return the meeting to President Jenkins. Thank you. Next, we have consent agenda for emergency adoption. Items 11 through 11, 1 through 14 are part of a consent agenda. These ordinances stand for emergency adoption. Unless someone wants to remove an item for further discussion, Council will move forward with emergency approval. Would the clerk please read items 11, 1 through 14. Item 1, an ordinance to appropriate funds from the various accounts in the Economic Develop De Development Department and declaring an emergency. 2, an ordinance appropriating funds from the unappropriated IT computer fund to an account in the police department and declaring an emergency. 3, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a contract with the Ohio Pol Patrolman's Benevolent Association for a period beginning January 1st, 2022 through December 31st, 2024 and declaring an emergency. Four, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to sign a memorandum of understanding with the Franklin County Children's Services regarding investigations of child abuse and neglect in Franklin County and declaring an emergency. Five, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to sign a memorandum of understanding for the Justice Assistant Grant for disparate funding agreement and declaring an emergency. Six, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a contract for the 2022 water line replacement project and declaring an emergency. Seven, an, 
an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a contract with emh and for construction inspection services for the 2022 waterline replacement project and declaring an emergency Eight, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a contract for the 2022 sewer improvement project and declaring an emergency. Nine, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a contract with emh and for construction inspection services for the 2022 sewer improvement project and declaring an emergency. 10, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into an agreement with the state of Ohio for the purpose of acquiring 0.246 acre sanitary sewer easement on the premises located at 8995 East Main Street, Reynoldsburg, Ohio, appropriating funds and declaring an emergency. 11, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a contract with complete general construction pertaining to the installation of a preemptive interconnect traffic system along East Main Street, appropriating funds therefore and declaring an emergency. 12, an ordinance to amend Chapter 160, Section 160.02, Authorized Positions, Personnel, Classification, and Pay Grade F Police Department. Section 160.02G2, Service Department Building Division. Section 160.03F, Other and section 160.043, other compensation, tomato festival event staffing compensation for the city of Reynoldsburg, Ohio, and declaring an emergency. 13, an ordinance authorizing the increase of appropriations for the various city jet agreements and declaring an emergency. 14, an ordinance appropriating funds from the various funds in the community events department and declaring an emergency. May I have a motion to approve these ordinances? So moved. Councilmember Baker may have a second. Councilmember Strickland, would the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Baker? Aye. Councilmember Strickland? Aye. Councilmember Savati? Aye. Councilmember Pecoro? Aye. Councilmember Lawson Rowe? Aye. And Councilmember Cotner? Aye. That was 7 0. Six. These ordinances that are That was 6 0. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. These ordinances are approved. Six affirmative votes and no negative votes. Consent agenda for a first reading. Items 12, item 12, number one, is part of a consent agenda. These ordinances stand for a first reading. Unless someone wants to remove this item for further discussion, council will move forward with a first reading. Would the clerk please read item 12, number one. An ordinance accepting, approving, and ratifying the submitted recommendations of several City of Reynoldsburg Tax Incentive Review Councils. This ordinance stands for a first reading. Consent agenda for a second reading. Items 13, 1 through 3 are part of a consent agenda. These ordinances stand for a second reading unless someone wants to remove an item for further discussion. Council will move forward with a second reading. Would the clerk please read items 13, 1 through 3. Item 1, an ordinance to amend the official zoning map for the City of Reynoldsburg for a property located at 8555 East Main Street from the Innovative District to Community District. 2, an ordinance authorizing the City Auditor to remove equipment from the City's fixed asset list for the Reynoldsburg Police Department. And 3, an ordinance authorizing the Mayor to enter into a contract with emh and for the engineering plans and preparation of bid documents for the 2023 Street and Sidewalk Maintenance and Repair Program and appropriating funds therefore. These ordinances stand for a second reading. Next, we have a consent agenda for a third reading. Items 14, 1 through 4 are part of a consent agenda. These ordinances stand for a third reading and approval. Unless someone wants to remove an item for further discussion, council will move forward with a vote on these ordinances. Would the clerk please read items 14, 1 through 4. Item 1, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to accept and enter into an agreement with the Ohio Public Works Commission, OPWC, Clean Ohio Green Space Conservation Program for Black Lick Creek Stream Restoration and Riparian Corridor corridor enhancement and appropriating funds. Two, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to accept a grant and enter into an agreement with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, ODNR, for the Black Lick Creek Trail improvements and appropriating funds. Three, an ordinance appropriating funds from the unappropriated general fund to various accounts in the Parks and Recreation Department. And four, an ordinance to repeal and replace Chapter 105, five wards and boundaries of the code of ordinances for the city of reynoldsburg ohio may i have a motion to approve these ordinances Move. council member baker may i have a second second 
Okay. Council Member Council Member Packerell. Would you please call the roll? Council Member Baker? Aye. Council Member Strickland? Aye. Council Member Silvati? Aye. Council Member Packerell? Aye. Council Member Lawson Rowe? Aye. And Council Member Kotner? Aye. That was a 6 0 vote. These ordinances are approved with six affirmative votes and no negative votes. Next, we have other council matters. Does anyone on council have any further items that you would like to discuss this evening? Council Member Baker. Just a couple of things. One is uh, thank you to all the doctors, nurses, uh, our, force, uh, our men and women in the military and um, RPD um, and our teachers who are about to go back into the classroom. Um, sorry, summer breaks over, but hey, you got to go back to work. Um, <laughs> Also, I want to give a shout out to Drew, the mayor's intern. This will be his last council meeting. He's going off to college. Um, yeah, that is a round of applause. <laughs> That's an achievement. You know, I was uh, sitting up here thinking what to say, but I'm still in shock that he actually graduated from high school. So, <laughs> um, I told you I was going to give a little dig. But, um, uh, oh, also the African American Wellness Walk is August 13th. I just want to make sure. People are aware of that. I'm sure they are, but just want to re, um, restate that it's coming up. Please come out and walk. I'll be walking, or in my case, limping halfway through at least. But uh, it's a good event. Come out and uh, support, and that's all I have. Do you know what time? Uh, I think it starts at 9. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I think about the actual walk, I think, starts at 5, 7. The event, the think, event starts seven. at 7, but actually step off for the walk is... Anyway, the event starts at 7. I'm going to leave it at that. Please come out, get breakfast, have fun, all the above. Amateur hour is over for me, so it's back to you. Does anyone else have any items you'd like to discuss? Madam President, just a clarification. The uh, Planning Commission meeting is actually on August 11th as on August 4th. Everyone in the city of Ronaldsburg will be at the Tomato Festival. Thank you. Any other items to discuss? Our next upcoming meetings will be BZBA. Our next council meeting will be September 12th, 2022. If there's no other further business, this meeting is adjourned. And the time is now 8.30. Have a nice recess. We were all wrong. <laughs>